my name is Skylar Church. I am a California real estate broker as well as a member of the education department at Accredited Real Estate Schools. If you're new to our channel, Accredited is a uh, private school that is approved in California to provide those course requirements to be eligible to take that state exam. But also, we have a ton of different exam preparation options to make sure you're prepared to pass that state exam. And one of those study tools that we do is a Jeopardy type game. And this is a really great study method. Um, if you want me to keep continuing to produce these Jeopardy or question videos that we have, make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel so we can keep producing this content. And today's Jeopardy game is going to be about personal property, real property, appraisal, finance, real estate practice, and contracts. And I do go at a pretty fast pace, so feel free to pause, rewind, fast forward um, to you know help with your studying. Um, I just like to keep it at a re relatively steady pace. So let's get to it. So let's start with personal property number one. This is used to transfer ownership of personal property. What is used to transfer ownership of personal property? Well, you should be thinking of a bill of sale. Remember, a bill of sale is what is used to transfer personal property. So if you're selling um, a mobile home that's not attached to land and it's not real property and it's just personal property, you would be using a bill of sale and that is used to transfer ownership. With real property, we usually use deeds. Personal property too. Even though these items are attached to the space, they are considered personal property because the business tenant can remove and take them when the space is vacated in the future. So we're talking about an item that yes, it could be affixed to the, to the wall and you might think it is real property, but because it is a business tenant that owns them and is able to remove them and take them in the future with them, what is that? what are these called? This is called a trade fixture. Number three, a corn crop would be considered personal property if it is severed or this. So a corn crop that is attached to the root system is considered real property. Now, it is considered personal property though when it is severed, so it's cut, for instance, and now it's able you're able to move it, or even if the corn crop has been, um, still stays with the root system, but it's been sold, so it's been sold, then it is considered personal property. So it's considered personal property if it is severed or sold. Number four, this is the instrument that is used to secure a loan on personal property. So we've already talked about the instrument used to transfer ownership of personal property. What about what, you're, what would you use when you're securing a loan on personal property. Well, usually you think of like a mortgage or a trust deed, for instance, when you're dealing with real property, but with personal property, it is a security agreement. Security agreement. Number five, these are the tests for a fixture. Okay, so what is the acronym that comes to mind when you're talking about a fixture? What are the tests for it? Well, you should be thinking of Maria, because remember, a fixture is something that would be considered personal property, but because of a certain reason, so these, these tusks, for instance, it is considered real property, and it basically goes with the, prop, with the land, for instance. So the, you should be thinking of Maria, and what does Maria stand for? Method of attachment, adaptability or annexation, relationship, intent, and agreement. So you need to know these for the test of a fixture. As you can see, time, cost, and size are not a test for a fixture, but these five are. Real property number one. So we're changing categories. Planted trees, vegetation, and trees in nature are considered this. Well, the name of the category should give it away, but these are considered real property. They are attached to the land. So planted trees, vegetation, and trees in nature, 
They are fixed to the land and that is considered real property. Real property number two. Real property is defined as land and anything that does these two things to the land. So when we're thinking of real property, we think of land, anything affixed to the land, and anything appurtenant to the land. So those three um, is what composes real property, land, anything affixed to the land, anything appurtenant to the land. Real property number three. An appurtenance, an appurtenance does this with the land. Well, what does an appurtenance do? It runs with the land. An appurtenant runs with the land. So for instance, an easement is an, um, an appurtenant easement. That runs with the land. CCNRs run with the land. Mutual um, water stock company, that runs with the land. An appurtenance runs with the land. Real property number four. Land is considered to be composed of these three main categories. So you know how we've talked about real property of land, anything affixed, anything appurtenant to the land. Well, land itself is considered to be composed of the airspace, the surface, and underneath the surface. Now remember, it's what you can reasonably use though within the airspace as well as underneath the surface. But this includes like mineral rights, um, the soil. Um, so airspace, surface, and underneath the surface is what composes land. Number five, legally and technically, property de is defined as this. So what is property defined of legally? Well, you should be thinking of maybe the bundle of rights. So you have like your interest in a thing owned. So the rights or interest which a person has in the thing owned. Rights or interest which a person has in the thing owned. Appraisal number one. Reduction in local property taxes, more liberal depreciation schedules, and a rising population are considered as this to a property owner. So if a property owner is having an increase in value, for instance, because of the reduction in local property taxes, more liberal depreciation schedules, and there's a rising population, well, this, is because of, this isn't because of anything the property owner has done. This is an increase in value, but it, he didn't earn it. So it's an unearned increment. Unearned increment. Number two, corner, cul-de-sac, interior, T intersection, key, and flag are considered these. Well, when you hear these terms, you should be automatically thinking of lot types. Lot types. And you should know what each of these are too. Just, um, you know, corners, your corner lot, cul-de-sac when you're in a court, interior, so you're pretty much just on a street and surrounded by um, people. T intersection, you know, when a, it kind of gives that T shape where your house faces another street, um, the end of another street, for instance, then you have key and flag. Um, so I would look these up just to play safe, but these refer to lot types. Appraisal number three. This appraisal principle is best described by having the best property in a neighborhood adversely affected by the presence of substandard property. So you basically kind of, in a way, over-improve your property to make it look really nice, but it's not in that great of an area. The other properties aren't that great. Due to that, you are having the principle of regression. Regression. Not progression, regression. You're adversely affected by the other properties. Number four. When an appraiser analyzes a vacant parcel of land, the first thing the appraiser should do is look at this, okay? So the first thing an appraiser will want to do when it comes to a vacant parcel of land is look at and see what the highest and best use of that land is. Highest and best use. Five, gross scheduled income, less vacancy, bad debts, rent collection losses, and operating expense expenses equals this. So we have our gross scheduled income, and then we take into consideration what we actually, we didn't receive, 
um, and then our expenses, the outflow of money. Well, then we get our net operating income, or NOI, net operating income. Finance, changing gears here, number one. This type of real estate loan provides that the interest rate increases or decreases depending upon money market conditions. So you have a loan and the interest rate can vary. Well, that is a variable interest rate loan. Number two, amortization tables are used to calculate this. So when we have an amortized loan, we use these tables because it assists us, assists us with figuring out what the monthly payment is and also assist on how much of the monthly payment will go towards interest and how much will go towards principal each month. Number three, this is considered the initial down payment, an owner's interest over and above all liens against it, and the difference between the loan amount and the value of the property. So these three might seem like different things, but it all means the same thing. It means equity. So your initial down payment is equity in the home. And then your owner's interest over and above all liens against it. So for instance, if you have um, a loan against it, that's a lien. It's encumbering the property. If you have um, maybe a judgment against it or um, taxes due, for instance, um, a special assessment on it, something, you know, that is encumbering the property. It's leaning. It's, it's a lien. Um, uh, because it is uh, limiting your title based on money, well then your interest that you have over what you basically owe is equity and the difference between the loan amount and the value of the property. So that's just another way of kind of saying, you know, the loan is a lien and then what you have in the property. So this is all just a fancy way of talking about equity and also appreciation is taken into consideration for this the difference between the loan amount and then the value of the property so you take into consideration your initial down payment but also what the market value is and has it gone up in value finance four when a trustee is used this person holds bare legal title so remember when we use trust deeds we have the trustor who's the borrower the beneficiary who's the lender but then we have the trustee who holds bare legal title they have the power to foreclose the property if you the trustor defaults on your payments and then once the trustor though pays off the entire loan amount a deed of reconveyance is used to provide the legal title fully back to the trustor from the trustee finance five this is when the lender does not approve the assumption and the seller continues to remain primarily liable for repayment of the loan for five years. You don't see these often actually in practice, but because it's a weird concept, you might see it on the state exam. And so this is like an assumption, but it's not approved. So it's technically a subject to. You are um, the borrower is not approved by the lender to assume the loan. So you are taking it subject to, and the seller continues to remain primarily liable for repayment of the loan for five years from the assumption date that is subject to. Real estate practice one. A real estate broker advertises that he will give a seller a $50 credit in escrow on his commission to any seller who lists with him, and that he'll pay $50 to any buyer who purchases a property from him. It is legal if this is done. So usually it's not the best idea when you're giving money out because you it can get you a little bit in hot water, but it is technically legal um, if you do all the required disclosures to all the parties in the transaction. So making sure it's completely disclosed correctly. It's very, very important. Um, so make sure to know for state exam purposes if you're giving money to um, the seller or the buyer, it is allowed if the disclosures are made, but you could get in hot water because the lender may not allow this. Um, if you're a salesperson, the broker needs to be, you know, 
in the loop of it. There's just a bunch of things that could go wrong with it. So, but for state exam purposes, this is the correct um, answer. Real estate practice. A broker has discovered that one of his or her salespeople has received an illegal referral fee from a lender. The broker does only the following two things. He or she fires the salesperson and warns the rest of his office salespeople not to do the same thing. This, these person or persons may be subject to discipline. So the broker fires the salesperson, but then warns the rest of the office that they should not do that. Well, who's subject to discipline here? Both the broker and the salesperson, because the salesperson did the illegal act. The broker, though, is super, has to supervise the salesperson and allowed the salesperson to do this under his supervision. Even though it was fired, you do need to um, uh, inform the commissioner about this. So really important to know. Number three, this is the court case that first introduced the real estate transfer disclosure statement. So what is the court case that brought about the TDS? Well. You should be thinking of Easton versus Strasburger. I have a cat named Easton, you know? So that's how I remember it. If you have to think of it, just remember Skylar's cat, Easton versus Strasburger. <laughs> um, practice number four. This act requires all owners of properties located within a quarter mile wide strip along an earthquake fault zone to disclose it to prospective purchasers. So it's a quarter mile wide strip. It's an eighth of a mile on each side from the center of the fault line, but that does vary based on topography. So when we're looking at this, what act requires this disclosure? The seller needs to disclose that it's within a quarter mile wide strip along an earthquake fault um, zone to disclose. Well, it is the Alquist Priolo Special Earthquake Studies Zone Act. Alquist Priolo Special Earthquake Studies Zone Act. And I'm working from home right now, so I apologize. That was actually how we just talked about Easton. Easton in the background making noise. So, <laughs> um, practice number five. If there is a dispute regarding a commission between two sales licensees who are members of the National Association of Realtors, by provision of that organization's code of ethics, they will settle the matter by this. Well, if the licensees are realtors, so both members of the National Association of Realtors, then in the code of ethics that they have within the organization, all disputes regarding a commission are settled through arbitration. Arbitration. Um, so you might be wondering why this is a question for a California real estate licensee when this is just done through an association. Well, this association is a big, um, really big one throughout the entire United States. And so there are certain things that the state wants you to be aware of. And this is one of them. Contracts number one. Okay. Rejection of the offer by the offeree would automatically do this to an offer to purchase real property. So remember, the offeror is the one submitting the offer or counteroffer. And the offeree is the one receiving the offer or counteroffer. So if the offeree um, rejects it, well, then it would automatically terminate the purchase of the offer to purchase real property. And you can't go back once it's terminated. You can't go back and um, try and um, uh, accept it once it's been terminated or um, you submitted a counteroffer, for instance. Contracts two. A promise in exchange for a promise is considered this type of contract. Okay, so remember, we've, there are different types of contracts. A unilateral contract is promise in exchange of an act, whereas a bilateral contract is a promise in exchange for a promise. A bilateral contract. Number three, Abel obtained a 60-day option to purchase a parcel of real property for $20,000. He or she paid $1 for the option. The option is valid if this is done. Of course, this right here does not look like it would actually happen in the real world with these numbers, but remember, this is theory, and by theory, this is valid if the, um, the $1 
was actually delivered. So if that $1 was actually delivered, the option is valid. Even though that might seem very trivial, $1 for a $20,000 option. As long as that $1 was actually delivered, then the option is valid. Contracts number four. When the offer is patently frivolous, a broker is relieved of this obligation. So when an offer is obviously frivolous, so we call it patently frivolous, then the broker is relieved of presenting the patently frivolous offer. Um, so for instance, if it's, a, if it's like a million dollar listing and you get a $1 offer, that's patently frivolous, you are relieved of your duty to present the offer. Contracts five. A minor can receive title to real property without court approval by these two methods. So a minor, so this is somebody under the age of 18. They do not have the capacity to contract, so they have not been emancipated by the courts. They're not married, divorced, or in the military. They can receive title to real property um, without court approval if it is through gift or inheritance. Now, if the minor has the property though, they would need to have court approval to actually convey the property though. But they can receive title as long as it's through gift or inheritance without court approval. So that is it for Jeopardy. If you have any questions at all or want to check out our other exam preparation options, make sure to check us out at accredited real estate schools. We are located only in California, so we specialize just in California. Um, there's no national exam. It's only a state exam that does contain certain national components, but it's a tricky one and we want to make sure you pass. So um, I hope this was helpful, but otherwise, good luck with your licensing journey and hopefully we get the contact, we get the opportunity to be in contact with you throughout your licensing journey. Thank you so much.